Um, so now my pleasure to introduce again our friend and colleague, uh, Linda, uh, Linda. <laughs> Lisa, <laughs> Lisa Kavarika, uh, who's well known to people at the Institute because she teaches on our history of art program, who's a regular contributor to the Wednesday Lecture Series. And tonight is the first of a, a, a trio of lectures she's going to give us about the great libraries of Florence, where Lisa spent a huge amount of her life uh, digging around in the, in the extraordinary collections of the, these libraries and making some interesting and unusual discoveries. So over to Lisa for part one of the Great Library series, which is the Biblioteca Medicea Lorenziana. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Simon. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. And it's such an honor to give this lecture about the Great Libraries of Florence in this library in the British Institute. Uh, so this is a special evening for me. Uh, I have to say that when Simon first asked me what I'd like to speak about tonight, I thought, well, you know, my last lecture, I got some a good reception about uh, my research, uh, uh, my adventures really, in researching Jewish history at the Archivio di Stato. And I thought maybe everybody would be interested in finding out more about my research and my sort of learning through the various uh, manuscript libraries in Florence. Um, and also I thought, well, this will be pretty easy because you know every scholar loves to talk about their first research and how they got started. And it's like showing baby pictures. You know, I thought this will be, a, this will be a snap. Actually, I've worked so hard putting together this lecture because I realized the profound depth of my ignorance in some ways about these libraries. As Simon said, I do know how to do research there and I've spent a lot of time in these three libraries that I'll be discussing. Um, but the knowledge that a scholar has of a library, a scholar of any variety of topics that they're researching is very different than the type of knowledge that a librarian, for instance, has about that place. You know, we come in and roll up our sleeves and sort of have our pickaxes and we're down in the mines looking for that gold. And we're trying to follow our research where it's going to take us. And we'll do whatever we can to get to the bottom of that. And we're really sort of with blinders on looking at our particular corner of history in my case. Whereas a librarian is more like a geologist who knows the depths of that mountain that you're mining. They know where the great veins of gold are and they know the great history of the centuries that went before us. Uh, and that's what I've had to really, you know, throw myself into this week in preparing today's lecture. That said, if you stick around with me, I think it's going to be an interesting talk uh, because my research took me in kind of an interesting direction. And even though it sounds very dry and you know sort of dull on the surface to talk about a library, there is nothing dull about these libraries, by the way. But if it does sound that way, I promise you, I have something very spicy for you at the end, which was where my research eventually took me. Okay, so we're starting today on our trilogy with the Biblioteca Medicea Laurenziana, or the Laurenziana, as uh, scholars call it here in Florence. The Laurenziana also is the first library that I went to in my studies from graduate school. And it's an appropriate place to start as well because she's sort of the grand dame of libraries in Florence located in the complex of the Basilica of San Lorenzo, of course, one of the oldest buildings in Florence. Uh, it was uh, dedicated uh, in 393 by none other than St. Ambrose. Uh, by about a thousand years later, the place had you know, decayed a lot and needed some work and the Medici family stepped up to the plate and paid for a lot of work to happen on this building. Uh, Brunelleschi uh, was one of the people who uh, Cosimo de' Medici got involved in the project. Uh, later Michelozzo and Manetti got involved in renovating this entire complex that is the Basilica and the entire San Lorenzo building area that we're going to be looking at. Um, the library, the Laurenziana Library is located within the building of San Lorenzo. Uh, this is an image, of course, of a manuscript in the Laurenziana Library of none other than St. Ambrose who dedicated uh, the Basilica. 
But in order to see this manuscript, we have to go into the library itself. So we're not going to go in the main door of the Church of San Lorenzo, but we're going to go in this side door um, near where the ticket office is into the cloister in order to get to the Laurenciana Library. Uh, the cloister is very lovely, also was renovated by the Medici family in the 15th century, the Chiostro dei Canonici. Work began on that in 1419, um, also Brunelleschi's work. Uh, and <clears throat> it's a very lovely, gracious cloister. Uh, it's a nice way to go to work in the morning when you're on your way to those <clears throat> library mines. Um, when you walk along the uh, loggia, going towards the back. First, you pass by the area that goes beneath the uh, main altar where you get the actual tomb of Cosimo de' Medici and Donatello. You go beyond that and there is the entrance to the grand staircase of the Laurenziana Library. This was originally conceived of by Michelangelo uh, to be uh, constructed in wood, evidently in walnut. Um, and it was eventually, however, realized by Bartolo Amanati in Pietra Serena, uh, that is sandstone, if you pray sandstone, based on a wax model by Michelangelo. Uh, the structure is very unusual. It's in three parts. Here are some of the sketches of Michelangelo's for the staircase in the Laurentiana. It has three sections and it has these wonderful kind of elliptical um, stairs on the side there. The reading room is a blast of light and beautiful warm wood colors um, and windows everywhere, lots of natural light for scholars to read by. It has two rows of these benches that are known as the plute. The design for the plute reading desks were also by Michelangelo. Here's one of his drawings for the pluteo or one of the Pluteo, the idea was that there would be on each side on the um, aisle, let's see if I've got a better picture of that. On the aisle here, you have a list of all the works that would be contained in the shelf. There's a little shelf area above the scholar's knee and the books would rest on the lectern chained to the wooden stand that it's on. This is a book with an actual chain on it, the way it would have been attached originally to one of these reading desks. To this day, when you are in the reading room in the Laurentiana and somebody pages one of these original Plute, it almost sounds like, you know, the Canterbury ghost or something coming, you know, clunk, clunk, clunk. You hear those chains as they deliver the book to the table in the reading room. Because as you can tell here, all these Plute, are completely empty. This is no longer used as an actual reading room. This is the historical reading room that was designed uh, back in the 16th century. The books are now kept down below in the, um, uh, in the um, storage rooms of the uh, library. Um, however, the original room is well worth a visit. It's, a, it's an extraordinary work of architecture, but uh, it's not what I'm focused on today. What I want to show you is where scholars go to study and how those studies are carried out and what we look at. So first, you go beyond the entrance to the actual famous Michelangelo designed uh, reading room. And you go up the side stairs where it reads Biblioteca Medici Laurenziano. You go up to the top of these steps and you turn the corner. And on a recent morning, this is what it looked like with the sun beaming over the cloister. Um, quite beautiful, uh, like you expect to hear the angels singing as you get up there. Not a shabby place to go to work in the mornings. So this is the area where on the first floor where you go into the actual Medici Laurenziana very unassuming door, you ring the little bell and they let you in and you show your documents and off you go. Before we go into the reading room though, and before I show you the kind of research that's carried on there, I want to take a moment to talk about the Medici family and what they did in terms of constructing, not just the building, but the collection that's contained within, because it is one of the finest most extraordinary collections of manuscripts and incunabula 
in the world. Uh, and it's really quite a treasure, just as you go to the Uffizi and you recognize oh, this is an amazing museum and it's the fruit of you know, the Medici families collecting the things that you see in terms of art are immediately striking, but very few people as they walk in from the Basilica of San Lorenzo pause to think about the extraordinary works that are kept within this library. The basic works that the collection was founded on were begun by, um, the collection was begun by Cosimo the Elder, uh, Cosimo il Vecchio. Um, he not only funded, he paid something like 40,000 florins for the renovation of the exterior of the Basilica of San Lorenzo, but he began putting together a collection of very rare manuscripts with help from some of his friends who were humanists and book collectors like Niccolo Nicoli uh, and booksellers like Vespasiano da Bisticci, who also um, copied or had his copyist copy many, many volumes for Cosimo. At the same time, Cosimo was collecting the Biblioteca Privata, the pre private library of the Medici family. Keep in mind always that the Medici family can't always be separated their activities the private from the public functions. At the same time, he was collecting books for his private use. He was also uh, assembling a Biblioteca Medicia Publica, a public Medici library in the library of the convent of San Marco, which he had begun uh, having rebuilt uh, in 13, excuse me, in 1438 by Michelozzo. And the library of San Marco, which you're looking at here, on the right hand side of the screen um, is where Cosimo had many, many books uh, specially designed and, um, and illuminated by the workshop of uh, Vespasiano da Bisticci. Also, you know that uh, Beato Angelico was a friar at San Marco and was painting, of course, and along with a whole team of painters, the beautiful frescoes in the cells at San Marco. At the same time also, there were many, many manuscripts that he and his workshop were illuminating. And there are some very, very precious manuscripts when you go into uh, the convent of San Marco that you can see um, on display usually opened up to a certain page. You can see a portion of them with extraordinary illustrations. So these are some of the books that were contributed to the Medici collection by Cosimo the Elder. And the majority of these works in the library of San Marco went over into the Laurenziana library that we have today. I'm gonna to be showing you the way these, this collection of books really traveled over time from one place to another. So the son of Cosimo was Piero the Gaudi, Piero il Gotoso, and he also was quite a book collector and book lover. He did a lot in terms of rebinding many of the manuscripts, but many of the books have his inscriptions on them as well. As you can see this uh, St. Augustine City of God on the bottom says, Liber Petri de Medicis on the bottom as a sign of his ownership of the book. Um, and he um, contributed to what his father had begun in terms of collecting rare manuscripts. The one who really started to increase the collection, however, was Lorenzo the Magnificent. Under Lorenzo, the collection increased immensely. Uh, he accumulated 67 manuscripts from Francesco Sassetti, a business associate of the Medici. Uh, he also acquired Philelfo's Greek, Greek manuscripts. And the Greek scholar Janos Laskaris um, went hunting for manuscripts for Cosimo de' Medici, went to Constantinople, to the monastery in Mount Athos, uh, and he sought out some of the rarest uh, Greek manuscripts, which were not known at that time yet in Europe. Um, so there are such extraordinary works that were collected under Lorenzo. These are just a couple of them I've got on the screen, such as this very old commentary on Homer's Iliad. It's an autograph copy of uh, Eustathius of uh, Thessalonica. When we say an autograph copy, it's not like, you know, you know, just an, a signature and, you know, you know, you know, uh, Eustathius was here. Uh, it's that the actual individual who wrote the book copied it in their own hand. And they're very rare to have autograph manuscripts um, from any period, but especially this early. Uh, so, so these are some of the only and unique copies that exist in some cases in the world. 
Also, uh, Lorenzo collected surgical and medical texts. This is from the School of Hippocrates from the 9th to 10th centuries. These are all in the Pluteo collection. So you see that um, the call number, Plut dot, 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 dot. That just means that it was originally located on one of those wooden lecterns in the main reading room. And it still has that designation today because that's the collection it's in. Now, after the death of Lorenzo de' Medici in 1492, uh, Florence went into a period of kind of tumultuous times and a very, very complex political time that I'm not gonna go into much detail about, but I do wanna point out that it had consequences for the Medici library. Uh, two years after Lorenzo died in 1494, the Medici were exiled from Florence at the time of the entrance of the French, the French invasion of Italy in 1494. And Florence fell under the sway of, of course, the friar Girolamo Savonarola. Now, this is an interesting moment for the Medici library because we've got that public private function. Uh, there were the collection that was sitting there in the um, convent of San Marco. And it was really important to decide once Florence returned to the control of the Republic at the time of uh, Savonarola in 1494, um, you know, what were they gonna do with this collection that had been accumulated and paid for by the Medici family? The Medici were now persona non grata in Florence. So there were big deliberations and we have all the records of those deliberations. Some people just wanted to, you know, take them over and to, you know, sell them off or some people under the influence of, you know, sort of religious zeal wanted to burn them. And of course, we all know that Savonarola was famous for his bonfire of vanities and many works of art and uh, precious books and uh, beautiful fabrics and jewelry and things were being destroyed at the time of Savonarola. As a matter of fact, Savonarola was a very learned man and really appreciated these classical works that the Medici had accumulated. And he spoke up in favor of preserving all of those works. And the Medici collection was kept in the convent of San Marco where Savonarola was the prior at the time and they were protected. Of course, Savonarola himself wasn't protected for very long because in 1498, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, rather than a bonfire of the vanities, we have the bonfire of Savonarola. Mm -hmm. So Savonarola leaves the scene, the Republic returns, the Medici library is sort of up for grabs and it's in a point of danger uh, in terms of you know, what's going to happen to it. The convent of San Marco wants to possess it um, you know, firmly forever. However, not even the Republic obviously is gonna last forever. And when the second Republic goes down in 1513, when Leo X, Giovanni de' Medici, the younger son of uh, Lorenzo de' Medici becomes Pope, he says, I want all the Medici collection with me in Rome. And he has all of the manuscripts packed up and brought to Rome with him. When his cousin, Clement VII, becomes Pope, Giulio de' Medici, um, in 1523, he says, no, these books belong in Florence, in our homeland, uh, and they are all repatriated at that time. And Clement VII decides that uh, a regular library on Medici premises in San Lorenzo has to be built. And he's the one who decides that Michelangelo should design the library. So it's a purpose-built library for a lay public. It's very, very important that that was the concept. And that was why Michelangelo designed it in ways that were very user friendly, right? Um, so this is under Clement VII. But this is not the end of the tribulations for the Laurentiana Library at the time. Because of course, after the sack of Rome in 1527, once Clement VII comes out of prison in Castel Sant'Angelo, and he makes friends and makes peace with Emperor Charles V, he decides he's gonna come back to Florence and take back Florence for Medici rule. So the siege of Florence in 1529 to 30, of course, Michelangelo himself participated by doing some of the uh, architectural work and supporting the bastions, particularly on the Southern walls of Florence during the siege. And when Florence fell, after, after the siege and had to capitulate 
to uh, the troops of uh, Clement VII, Michelangelo fled. He had not finished uh, work on the library. Um, he had to take, uh, he had to, uh, um, to hide and uh, he left actually for Rome at that point. All right, in 1537, when uh, Cosimo de Medici becomes Grand Duke Cosimo I, uh, there is stability in Florence. We're gonna see the Medici dynasty ruling for 200 years. Uh, and this bodes very well for the library of Florence, not so well for the Republic of Florence, but the Medici library is now safe. In fact, Cosimo uh, not only hunts down the assassins of, uh, you know, of the Duke um, Lore, Loren, Lore, um, Alessandro, uh, who had preceded him, but he hunts down volumes that had been dispersed during the time the Medici were exiled from Florence. So there are many, many precious volumes that Cosimo collects and has reinstated and put back into the Laurentiana Library. Um, and it's at this time that Amanati is hired to carry out Michelangelo's plans. Uh, Michelangelo from Rome is sending drawings such as the ones that I showed you uh, and models for his plans for the library and the library is completed uh, during this time. So it's very tumultuous times for the library, but the library stayed fairly safe from that point on. Um, with the big exception was, was of course World War II. During World War II, uh, the precious volumes in the Laurentiana Library were sneaked out, they were evacuated and taken to the Badia di Passignano, uh, where they were hidden for the duration of the war. And the so-called plute, those reading lecterns that I showed you, were stored down below in the vaults of San Lorenzo. So very kind of exciting history for the collection of books and the library itself during this time. Okay, now that I've talked about the Medici family and their collection, still before I take you into the library, I gotta show you sort of the greatest hits of the Laurenziana. And this was quite complicated for me to assemble and you'll see why it's hard to choose among so many beautiful and exquisite and rare works what to include in a talk like this in such a short amount of time. But let me give you kind of a quick tour of the kind of greatest hits of the Laurentiana Library. Um, the precious, precious volumes here, there are over 11,000 rare manuscripts and in incunabula. Um, they are, some of them, unique exemplars in the world, many of them the oldest in existence. Um, works of Tacitus, Pliny, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Quintilian, works that are unique. Um, this, for instance, is one of the treasures of the library, the Amiatinus Bible, which is the oldest complete edition of the Bible. It's 1,040 pages. This is only one chunk of it. You're seeing somebody opening with their gloved hands on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, it was produced around a little bit before 700 CE uh, in a Benedictine monastery in northeastern part of England, uh, commissioned by Albert, uh, excuse me, Abbot Selfred in 692. He was bringing it to Rome to give as a present to Pope Gregory II. Unfortunately, the abbot died on his way to Rome. Um, I don't have the whole story of how that happened, but the Bible, this precious, precious Vulgate of St. Jerome ended up in the, uh, ab um, excuse me, the uh, Abbey of um, San Salvatore in Monte Amiata, uh, which you see here on the screen in Southern Tuscany, around 900, it was present there and it found its way into the Medici collection. The oldest copy of Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis known as the Codex Florentinus, uh, that was copied in the seventh century is in the Laurentiana Library. This is what, you know, the big flowering of the universities, the University of Bologna, and all of the great jurists of the late Middle Ages and the first of, you know, Renaissance study of law 
Roman law, which is now the basis of our you know, criminal justice across Europe and, and, and America, uh, came from the Corpus Juris Civilis. And the Medici family owned the oldest copy of this, copied uh, during uh, the time of Justinian. This volume is always cited, very, very important codex, um, the um, Codex, uh, Codex Medicius of Virgil. Uh, it is the most complete and oldest codex of Virgil's works. Uh, it was purchased by uh, Duke Francesco Primo, Grand Duke, uh, the son of Cosimo I. Um, it, was, it is of such importance that it is always consulted as one of the prime texts uh, for any edition of Virgil. It was appreciated a little bit too much by the Napoleonic scholars who were here um, during the Napoleonic uh, thieveries, the Furti Napoleonici, and it was taken away for a short time to Paris. Uh, and you can see that it was rebound and we see the letter N on the binding here. Uh, it was given Napoleon's name, but it was repatriated after the fall of Napoleon. So it came back to where it belonged in Florence. Cosimo the Elder had three complete collections of Plato's dialogues. Here we see it in Greek on the left-hand side. Uh, you'll recall as well that um, you know, uh, Cosimo hosted the Pope and the Byzantine Emperor at the conference at the um, uh, the Council of Florence. Uh, and that was a time also when many Byzantine manuscripts came into uh, Florence. So this copy of Plato's Timaeus, for instance, was given or lent rather by Cosimo to Marsilio Ficino, the great humanist scholar who then translated uh, all of these works of Plato into Latin for the first time in Europe. So here on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see Ficino's um, a beautiful manuscript translation with, of course, the Medici coat of arms at the bottom of uh, Plato's dialogues. Other works, very importantly, the Squarcialupi co uh, Codex, named after Antonio Squarcialupi, uh, who was the organist in Florence's Duomo, a really great uh, musician at uh, the time in the 15th century, who owned this precious volume at one point. It's 216 parchment folios. It's enormous. It's so precious that you hear musicologists talk longingly about being able to view it, to actually touch it. Very few have. In fact, the way most people are able to access it is through one of these very expensive facsimile editions because the originals are just too precious to be handled. Um, it is the only and most comprehensive collection of secular polyphonic music uh, from the late 13th to the 14th centuries that exists. So this is not um, liturgical, you know, religious music, but actual popular music um, that was copied and it's beautifully illuminated with these images of the various composers on each of the pages. Um, so it's a, an incredible work. Um, we're not sure exactly uh, how uh, a musician like uh, Antonio Squarcialupi got a hold of this and was able to pay for this. It would have been an extraordinarily uh, precious volume, um, but it certainly was in the possession of Giuliano di Lorenzo de' Medici, uh, the youngest son of uh, Lorenzo, um, who then put it in the Medici library. Uh, so this is in the Laurenziana collection as well. This is the oldest Florentine codex of Dante's Commedia. Florentine because it's in Florentine dialect, not copied somewhere else in some other part of Italy. We don't have an autograph of Dante's Commedia. There's no, nothing written in his own hand, uh, but this is very, very old uh, and very precious. Um, when we get to look at the Biblioteca Nazionale, I'll show you uh, yet another very valuable Dante manuscript there. Um, but here you can see, of course, the capital letter N and then E-L, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita. So you can see the actual lines here, a very, very valuable work. 
also in the Pluteo collection. Now we don't have autographs of Dante, but within the Medici and Medici Laurentiana, there are many other autograph manuscripts. There's the autograph of Guicciardini's History of Italy. There is uh, the autograph of Cellini's autobiography. There's also many autograph uh, copies of works, autograph manuscripts, I should say, they're not copies, they're autograph manuscripts written by Petrarch, for instance, this is Petrarch's handwriting. This is also in the Laurentiana collection and also Boccaccio. There are uh, two uh, of the three Zibaldoni or notebooks that Boccaccio kept. So these are in his own hand in his uh, commentaries and his various scribblings and his collection of ideas. And we get to see what Boccaccio was interested in what he was reading. Uh, and I'll be speaking a lot more about Zibaldoni in a moment as a kind of uh, typology of manuscript because that's what I focus on, that's my work. So these are Boccaccio's works. And then we have the entire collection of papyri. Uh, so these were the fruit, uh, especially of early 20th century Italian uh, papyrologists who went to Egypt. And some of the papyri are very, very valuable. Uh, for instance, this ostracon, this piece of pottery shard on the right-hand side of the screen is an ode of Sappho, very, very rare. This exists only on this piece that's in the Laurentiana Library. And you wouldn't necessarily expect this in a rare books collection from Renaissance Florence, but there you have it. This is collected, of course, after the Medici period. Um, and um, I guess the last work that I really want to speak about is, that the Medici collected, this is a very fascinating um, uh, codex, especially for Americans, I think. Uh, this is called the Florentine Codex, or sometimes the Saagun Codex, because it was a collection of three volumes that were compiled uh, by this friar, Bernardino di Saagun, who was a kind of early anthropologist. And he was in um, Mexico after the conquista and he collected in Spanish and Nahuatl. So this is a bilingual series of volumes about the culture, the customs, the clothing of the Aztecs. And it was written in 1577. It's a very interesting volume. It has a really interesting history to it, uh, which once again, I can't go thoroughly into, um, but the King of Spain, Felipe II, wanted to stop anyone from copying this. He did not want it you know, to spread around. He didn't want people knowing too much about the culture of this conquered civilization. Um, and Ferdinando de Medici got a hold of it when he was still a cardinal in Rome before he became Grand Duke. Uh, and he snapped it up and he kept it. He kind of kept it on the sly and he added it to the Medici collection. And it is a very, very unique uh, book. Here you can see some of the drawings of the, the paintings rather of these Aztecs, uh, and also in the center, very early representation of the turkey, which was of course a new animal for uh, Europe. Okay, I could go on and on with the beautiful manuscripts that are in the Laurentiana collection. I mean, this one just took my breath away when I started looking at this. Um, and I have to say, you know, as a scholar, who goes in and rolls up my sleeves and does that mining work. These are not works that I would normally see. In fact, I have never touched a single one of these exquisite, special, precious volumes that I've showed you. In order to get permission to access these, you need very special credentials and you can't just walk in and look at it. You don't just walk into the Laurentiana Library, you know, and say, you know, you can go to the Louvre and say, you know, where's the Mona Lisa? I wanna see it, but you can't just say, let me see the Amiatnes Bible. You know, it's like, you know, it's not like ordering, you know, waiter, let me have a Veuve Clicquot. You know, let me have your finest Montrachet. You don't do that in the library. The Laurentiana Library is a very special place and it takes special access to get to these works. And I can talk about that more uh, in a moment. But I do want to say that in looking at these, and I'll show you afterwards, I'll share with you uh, the very beautiful digital resources that you can use to look at these, uh, these manuscripts in great detail. Uh, you have to be careful for getting a dose of the Stendhal syndrome. As I was researching this to prepare today's talk, I had an overload of beauty in looking at these manuscripts because you can see them in such incredible detail uh, that 
in some ways, sometimes it's almost better than being there in real life. So I'm gonna stop showing these, these gorgeous illuminations and these precious manuscripts. And I'm gonna finally take you into the door and show you my research. Okay, so we buzz in the buzzer and what are we gonna find? Well, we're not gonna find this. This is what you would have seen if you went into the Laurentiana Library in that famous Michelangelo reading room back in the 18th century. This is what it looks like now except I've never seen that many people milling around. I found this photograph on the internet. Um, and frankly, I've never seen that many people in this little tiny reading room. They don't allow many people in at any time, but especially now during COVID, it's very hard to get access. This is what it looks like on an average day. This is when I was in taking the photographs for today's talk, looking at my manuscript, my humble little manuscript that I was after. Now this, manuscript that I looked for is Ashburnham 5043. And before I talk about the contents of Ashburnham 1543, let me just say that the Ashburnham collection is a separate collection from the Plute. There's a whole bunch of different collections. There's the Gadi, the Reddi, the Edili. There's, I don't want to go into all the details. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy uh, pastiche. But the Ashburnham collection, especially for those of you who are English, will appreciate this bit of history. Lord Ashburnham was a great book collector from the uh, uh, late, uh, for, excuse me, from the uh, 19th century. Uh, and he purchased a lot of books from this guy over here, Guglielmo Libri. Uh, Guglielmo Libri um, was a bibliophile and a thief. He was really quite a scoundrel and just about every library that he studied in, he stole books from and he made off like a bandit, especially from the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. When the son of Lord Ashburnham was in financial trouble and he wasn't as great a book lover apparently as his father, uh, he begins selling off these uh, books in auctions in 1897. And this is the catalog of uh, one of those auctions at Sotheby's. He found himself in hot water. Why? Because the Bibliothèque Nationale wanted their books back. In fact, this is part of the catalog where it explains that it originally contained, the Ashburnham collection, a number of volumes which the chief librarian at the Bibliothèque Nationale conclusively proved to have belonged at some time or other to that institution. So they got those back. Uh, however, of the, the rest of the collection, these very valuable book, books, these French romances, Dante Boccaccio Petrarch, Christine de Pizan, many of these were purchased by Italy and then given back to uh, Florence, to the Bibliothèque Nationale. So many of these were repatriated into uh, Florence. And there's some very, very fine works. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, Ashburnham, 409, the Ashburnham collection um, is about 2,000 manuscripts in the Nacional, uh, excuse me, in the Laurentiana. Uh, this is Castiglione's The Courtier, and it has autograph corrections by the author, also Pietro Bembo's comments, very, very precious work and a beautiful original uh, Cinquecento binding. Also, the uh, Cinquecento binding on Ashburnham 858 which has the coat of arms of Michele Ghisleri, who is the future Pope Pius V. Uh, so these are very precious works in the Ashburnham collection. The work I'm looking at is not a precious work. Let me just tell you, as a young scholar, well, younger, when I started looking at the uh, Ashburnham 1543, um, I was kind of intimidated to go into the Laurentiana Library. I was warned, especially by one very senior uh, scholar in the field, that you had to be careful, you had to dress appropriately. Uh, she went in on a very hot summer day in a muumuu and was unceremoniously kicked out. So I was prepared to behave myself and to dress well. Years later, I went into the Vatican Library and I was told different types of dress codes. One has to always follow the rules to get access to the books. It's just worth that much to get to them. But the actual manuscripts that I was looking at, it turned out weren't all that precious. And this is not one of the great Ashburnham collection. collection. In fact, it's one of the shabbier manuscripts. The manuscripts that I look at are known as Zibaldoni. A uh, Zibaldone, you might be familiar with uh, Giovanni Rucellai's Zibaldoni, it was published um, 
It's a commonplace book. It's an anthology, mostly of vernacular works that 15th century Florentines just liked and they copied them over and over again. And there are thousands of them uh, that attest to, of course, the vernacular literacy of Florentines in the 15th century, but also give us an insight into what they were thinking about and what they were really you know, interested in and excited by. Uh, and Ruccioli called his book a zibaldone. He called it an insalata di più erbe, a mixed salad, mixed greens. Uh, and you'll, the reader will understand that. Il quale libro si chiama il zibaldone quaresimale, a Lenten zibaldone. It's a poor thing. It's a Lenten. It's not a feast. It's a mishmash of things that I just threw together. Um, so as a category of manuscript, these are not the most precious. Most of them are falling apart. Very rarely does it have the original uh, you know, binding. They're, they're, they're a mess, many of them. But that's just what I wanted to study. And you'll see why in a moment. So the first Zibaldoni that I came across was Ashburnham 1543. I went to look at it because while I was in grad school at the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, there was a volume I was looking at, just learning paleography, learning how to read uh, the various hands from the 15th century. And it had kind of an interesting poem in it that I liked. It was called Igabade. So it was about people who talk about, you know, God a lot, hypocrites is the translation. Uh, and it's a very rare poem, along with a lot of poems attributed to Borchello. And in the notes, I found that it existed in this 1543 manuscript, you know, Ashburnham 1543. Um, it's a Quattrocento manuscript. So let's, let's look at it. And I went and looked at the, the sonnet and I was like, yeah, okay, there's the sonnet. And then it was the first Zibaldoni I looked at. Since then, I've seen hundreds of them and read them. But at the time I thought, well, let's see what's in it. You know, and I started what I would then come to use as my methodology, which was reading every page, just turning every page to see what it contained. So what is it? The very first page, it tells us, Opus Ovidi de Arte Amandi. Oh, it's the work of Ovid, the Ars Ama, uh, Amatoria, or Ar Arte Amandi in Volgare, it tells us. Now, I was just, you know, fresh out of grad school, and I'd just been studying Latin. My Latin is terrible, but it was still fresh in my mind from grad school. Uh, and I knew something about the Ars Amatoria, and we had read these famous first lines, and we had learned that Ovid was trying to do something very witty, that, of course, with my, you know, very, uh, you know, basic Latin, I couldn't entirely appreciate, but he was writing a didactic elegiac poem. So he was writing a poem that was a kind of a how-to manual, like, you know, how to, you know, assemble, you know, uh, you know, car parts we would have nowadays, something that was very, you know, hands-on. At the same time, it was playful because it was about how to, you know, find a woman, how to attract her, and how to, you know, uh, manage a love affair. Uh, and it's all done very much tongue in cheek. And it's very witty, very subtle. It's a charming work. I've read it since, obviously, in English translation. So Ovid exists in many, many volumes. Uh, with, Ovid was one of the most popular authors in Renaissance Florence. And Indeed, in the uh, Laurentiana Library, here's a very valuable Pluteo 36.2, which is uh, in Latin, the uh, Arte, uh, arte uh, Ars Amatoria. And here you can see the famous first line, si quis in hoc artem populo non novit amandi. If there's anybody among you who doesn't know about, uh, about loving, read this book and I'll teach you how. Uh, and so you see that. Um, and the Ovid was copied over and over and over again, both in Latin, here's a lovely Pluteo volume that has a little portrait of Ovid in the capital uh, there on the top. Here's yet another Pluteo, but this is much more the kind of thing that I would see, which is Ovid copied in the uh, vernacular. So in Volgare, here is a translation. Se a voi giovane, dilecta di imprendere la doctrina D'intendere e nutricare l'amoroso fuoco. If you young people want to learn how the doctrine of how to understand and to nourish the amorous flame, read this book, right? So it's kind of similar to Ovid, but it's in vernacular. Okay, so there's a lot of vernacular translations. They are being used to teach. People studied Ovid's Ars Amatoria in school. It was a way not just to learn Latin, but it was considered full of great moral precepts. 
medieval interpretations, crazy things. But in any case, let's get back to my volume because I want to wrap this up and I want to get to the, you know, to the, the climax, so to speak, of this volume. This is a very different vernacular translation from the one I just showed you and from all the other translations that I've ever seen of Ovid into, um, into vernacular, because it, it tells us on the first page what the intention is. Here, I've pointed at the passage on the first page and I'll just blow it up for you here. In English, it says, to many, the reading of the lofty and sublime work of Ovid is difficult. Some seek lighter fare. As you see here in this terza rima, it's a terza rima translation like Dante's terza rima, very popular form of poetry, which I will undertake to translate clearly. The copyist has uh, copied the words of the translator. I will undertake to translate clearly. The next line says, let's leave ornate eloquence of speech to one who follows Apollo. Right, so if you're interested in all that fancy stuff, don't read this. This is gonna be just basic how-to business. And the copyist is just on the first page is writing in the margins, you know, notes. Apollo es Deus Poetarum. Apollo is the God of the poets and goes on in Latin notations in the margins. The copyist has not yet, I think, figured out what he's copying. He thinks he's just copying another vernacular Ovid and, you know, maybe he's learning Latin and he's trying to like, figure this out, but this is not your standard copy uh, of a translation of Ovid. Ovid, I was trying to read the two side by side. So as the work sort of mirrors Ovid at the beginning and Ovid gets to a point where he writes, now the bed has received two lovers. The bed seems to know it. Now the door has been closed. Linger, O oh muse, at the door. They will not need you. Now for the words they will whisper and murmur nor will the left hand lie idle along the bed. Fingers will find what to do in those parts where love plies his weapons. Hector could use his hands in more endeavors than war, wink, wink, nod, nod. So this is the kind of stuff that Ovid was writing. It's charming, it's witty, it's sexy, but you know, it's, it's delightful. This is not how it gets translated in this work. So I'm thinking Hector, hands, war, I turn the page, and I see this manicule at the bottom, a finger that points at text in a manuscript is known as a manicule, a little hand. But I never since have seen any kind of manicule like this, this finger poking through this unusual object. And it's pointing at this line, which comes precisely in the portion of Ovid's Ars Amatoria that I just read to you about Hector using his hands in other things than war. And this is what it reads, and I've translated it literally as possible. With your fingers well aimed, go probing to the center of her sex until her pleasure is revealed to you, making sure to seek within her every nook and cranny. And you put that together with that image and you go, oh my gosh, <laughs> that manicule is actually showing us in a very explicit way, a kind of interpretation in the margins just like he had the Latin before, now he's got a very visual interpretation of what's been described in this translation. And it gets worse. There is so much in here. I can't give you all of it because there would be a whole lecture just on this particular translation, but it gets worse. Ovid in the next uh, passage says, take care not to fly with two full sails and finish the race ahead of her, right? It's, it's, you know, we get what he's talking about, but it's Ovid, you know, it's Ovid. It's, 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 it's very elusive, but it's not uh, explicit. Our translator, however, goes on to say, squeeze her tits, and then before she sends forth sperm, manage to remove your finger and climb on top of her. I'm not making this up. And in the margins, we see this note, la shive means lascivious. It, this, is, this is hot stuff, is what the copyist is saying. <laughs> La Chive, and bracketed this entire section. Got another manicule. I don't want to be overreading that. You can interpret that manicule for anything you'd like. Um, there's all kinds of interesting references in this work. But this, as the first of these Divaldoni that I looked at in the first library that I went into, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be a gold mine. I felt like really like I'd got my pickaxe ready and I was ready to go. Um, I never found another manuscript that was revealing in just this particular way. I found lots of interesting manuscripts, but this one was truly unique. Um, I did find uh, the name of the copyist 
uh, at the end, where it says Finis is the end of the Ovid portion, Johannes de Parvolis me scripsit, idibus septembris in uh, 1460, uh, this guy named Giovanni de Parvoli copied this book, um, and I've never been able to identify who he was, and I've worked very hard on it. It could be also because his name is in Latin. Parvoli could be Piccino, Piccini, Piccinini. It's very hard to know who this guy Giovanni was, but he really, um, together with you know the work of Ovid and the translator, really gives us an idea of the private life of at least one person you know, reading at this time. Uh, so this was the reason, this was what got me all excited to do my dissertation on this type of book, the Zibaldone manuscript, which then would take me beyond the Laurenziana to uh, places like the Biblioteca Ricardiana and the Biblioteca Nazionale, where the dress code wasn't quite as strict, um, but uh, I'll be showing you some of the manuscripts I discovered in those places as well. Uh, before I open up the floor for questions and Simon, I just wanna point out that the best book about the Biblioteca Medici Laurenziana that you can get is this one published uh, by Nardini, uh, which has a wonderful essay by the, one of the former um, directors of the Laurenziana, Antonietta Morandi, and a lot of details also about uh, the construction by Michelangelo. I would also send you to uh, the Biblioteca Medici Laurenziana online, where they have digitized so many manuscripts. It's just stunning. And this is where you get that Stendhal syndrome effect by looking at so much beauty, because you can see in such great detail uh, the, the, these various volumes. Um, the other place is the Library Cong of Congress World Digital Library. They have digitized an incredible um, high resolution. For instance, that Sagun Codex, the Florentine Codex from 1577 of the Aztecs. Uh, so I recommend you to go to these places. And in a way, even though it's hard to get access to the rare books collections, and most of us can only just dream of these kind of uh, amazing works, all of us in this day and age, it's almost a golden age of study of manuscripts today because we can see them increasingly online. Okay, that's the end of my talk today. And um, I'll open up the floor if anybody has questions and you can moderate, Simon. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Lisa. That was fantastic and really interesting. I'm going to, there we are, it's unshared, so we can now see the people on the Zoom. Um, as always, we welcome uh, questions from the room. Just put your hand up and I'll bring you the microphone. But also people who are with us on Zoom, if you want to speak, just uh, wave at me and unmute yourself and say something. So um, let's see if we've got anyone in the room who would like to get started. Stunned silence. Anyone up on the Zoom? There was a bunch of comments which I, uh, yes, went up during the talk. So let's have a look at some of those and see what we got in the chat. Um, so, wow, is it still at the British Library? Just down the road from where I live. Yep, we're here. <laughs> um, only then, uh, was the King Matthias Bible added to the library in 1489? I, I'm not certain about that. Um, is there anybody who is an expert on that particular work? You never know out there in the world. If any of my colleagues, uh, Davide uh, uh, Baldi or David Speranzi, Anna Russo, if anybody's out there, please add that in. Okay, another question. Thinking about the 1966 flood, please tell me that none of these books are stored on the lower floors of buildings. I also have the scans and photos of every single page. Yes, um, great question, because the Biblioteca Nazionale, as you know, is located on the banks of the Arno, and there was damage during the 1966 flood. However, to my knowledge, nothing in the uh, Laurenziana was damaged, um, to my knowledge. Um, certainly the most precious works uh, were preserved. Um, but this is the reason behind the digitizing, incidentally. It's not just to give everybody a kick at home to be able to look at these uh, you know, items, it's to be able to preserve them forever in case of such things as floods or fires or revolutions or whatever. Yeah. Small local footnote, the um, British Institute's library was relocated to Palazzo Lamprodini a few months before the flood in 1966, and there were still a number of books in boxes on, which haven't been unpacked on the gr ground floor. And I think we did lose quite a few books in the flood. 
we didn't have the resources or model angels to restore them. Um, other things in the comments. Yes. Uh, would there be would there have been a copy of Ovid's Art of Love in Lorenz in the Magnificence Library in the late 15th century? There would not only have been a copy, there would have been many copies. It was a really popular work, and uh, it was something that I think it was among the three or four most popular works during the Renaissance. Mm. So many people were using it as a as a manual. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. No wonder when I studied, uh, this is Rosalind Lowe, no wonder when I studied Ovid's poetry at school, our teacher refused to tell us about Ovid's predilections and instead gave us a book to read about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, that, that's the comments. Does anyone want to um, uh, unmute themselves on the Zoom and, and join in the conversation? Um, or have we got some, some thoughts stimulated in the room? I think you stunned them with so much knowledge. <laughs> Somebody was asking about yeah. the Amiantis, I'm oh, sorry, someone made a comment about the Amiantis Bible, oh. and that, where it started from, and it's probably stating the obvious, but that story, most people here that have read it, the uh, meetings with remarkable manuscripts considered to Hamill. Oh, no, good. Well, he, he, he gives one chapter, he gives the whole journey, and he then traces them, and he comes here, he goes to visit friends, it's, it's an excellent book. It's a so fascinating. That, one of his... Uh, one of his texts. You know, if you Thank you for adding that because that is one of the manuscripts that has a fascinating story and I'm glad somebody focused on it to actually write about it. You know, I can just imagine those saddlebags loaded with St. Jerome, you know, coming over the channel and coming down, you know, on, you know, mules uh, all the way down to Italy. It's so, a very full description. I mean, it's excellent. Thank you. Excellent. But, you know, actually, Lucia, do you have any idea about the um, the books in the Laurenziana Library during the 1966 flood? Have you ever heard our librarian, Lucia Capendi? Good afternoon, I totally agree with you. I don't think we had any, they had any damages during the flood in 1966. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Anybody up on the Zoom? Or in the, uh, uh, Ros, do you want to say something? Go on, Yeah, Simon, yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? Okay, Hi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. That was just tremendous, it, as ever. Um, I was interested in your comment about the Amiatinus Bible. Um, and, you know, I was asking sort of, where is it and where did it come from and uh, and um, Barbara Hazeldine actually filled me in on a, a, a trail there that it came from Jarrow and I was wondering where is it now and how did it actually get to Italy? Yeah, it got to Italy actually in you know uh, saddlebags on mules um, right. And in, it was separated, though, you know, as you know, over a thousand folios of parchment, it's huge, immense. So it was separated and broken up. And there's been a lot of codicological discussion about it. Um, I remember the librarians that I was associating with when I was doing my research being scandalized by a particular director reordering the folios and trying to change the order. And it was, you know, it was quite a, it was like the restoration of the Sistine Chapel for librarians. Um, so I would refer you to the book that was mentioned before for more details about the, you know, vicissitudes of this particular volume, because, you know, it has a whole you know, long, long history that, you know, I'm not fully informed on. This is not one of the books I've studied. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They wouldn't let me come within, you know, a 10 foot pole of this fall, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, no, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rod. Nice to see you again. Um, at this point, I'm just going to put in my weekly um, plea for uh, the donations from the people who've joined us in, on the Zoom. People who come to join us in the room uh, pay a registration fee. Access online remains free, but we are most grateful when people make donations of whatever size are convenient to help keep the uh, Wednesday lecture series going and healthy. So thanks in advance for that. Sarah will put up the link. Um, do we have any other thoughts? Yes, one more in the room. Um, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, could you comment on the accessibility to 
humble members of the public uh, to the various parts of the library? Please? Yeah, that's the part that I, I hate to say. It's very hard to get access to these libraries. Um, you know, you have to come with a letter from a university. Um, you often have to come with something with a seal on it. I remember being told that it helped if I went to the bookshop at UC Berkeley and bought a gold seal and you know licked the back of it and stuck it on the paper that they would like that. Um, but even when I was a Fulbright scholar and I had a letter with for the Ministro de Beni Culturali saying that you know I was a bona fide researcher, it was still hard to convince them to touch the actual works. At the time, they wanted me to look at microfilm much at the time. You know, microfilm was pretty shoddy way to look at manuscripts. It's hard to see it. Um, and nowadays they would undoubtedly send a young scholar just to look at the digitized versions if it has been digitized. Um, so it's very difficult uh, to get into the rare books collections, but the, 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 the silver lining is that it's very easy to get to the online access to the works. Otherwise, if you go to a show that they have at one of the libraries, like at the Laurenziano or the Nazionale, and under glass, they'll have the various manuscripts open to a certain page, and you can look at those illuminations and you can see them. It's not the same as being able to turn the pages and touch them, I understand, but that's the closest that usually you can get as a member of the public. Uh, so, Alan, I don't think you're going to get that. It just reminds me of an extraordinary story that Alan Prescuti told us a couple of years ago when he was talking about his, his um, engagement with Michelangelo's drawings and that he'd been at, um, I think, the Royal Collection in London and he asked to have access to the Michelangelo drawings. And the, the, the curator said, sure, and brought out a, 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 a collection of the original Michelangelo drawings and put them on the table and walked out of the room and left him to it. And uh, Alan was wondering whether he shouldn't just put them in his, in his briefcase and leave, but no, he didn't, so they're, they're still there. <laughs> Anyhow, um, Paul, yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for the presentation, which I thoroughly enjoy. Um, just in terms of your focus on the civil baby, um, and obviously I, I, I imagine a lot of these works, you might be the first person to, to, to delve into them if there are um, thousands um, in, in the library. Are you hoping to come across a vernacular translation of a, an original work that was lost and so therefore bringing something back from the dead? Yes, of course, we're all gold miners. <laughs> we all want that stuff. Um, but I find it more exciting when I can find, you know, if I can't find, you know, Dante's signature, you know, to you know, one of his works, I find the second best thing is being able to understand the minds of the people who kept these books. And that to me is fascinating when you can really kind of worm your way into their thinking and you, you feel like you've made a friend. And that, that I do enjoy. I think there's a couple more comments. Um, we'll be going to the comments. Uh, Besides how cool it is, are there advantages to looking at the original book rather than the digitized? And then a, a related question, who funds the digitizing, digitizing and is it ongoing? Yes, those are great questions. All of those questions are great, um, Nancy. Um, okay, um, besides how cool it is, are there advantages? Um, for me, the advantage is when I'm looking at my humble little Zibaldoni is that I can see what is next to what and it, it, I get a more direct contact with the process of copying, especially because the pages were often um, kind of out of order. The books fell apart from overuse and nobody cared about rebinding them. So sometimes you realize that this belonged next to this and it, it helps to see it in its codicological reality. But otherwise, if you're looking at the really valuable ones, I think and sometimes you can do a better job of saying like, is this a letter L or is it an I that, you know, the, you know, the dot above the, the, the staff. Um, and you can see that better when you can get really granular detail from these digitizations. The process is ongoing. The funding is a problem. You put your finger exactly on the problem there. I talked to a friend of mine who's the former librarian at the Biblioteca Nazionale. And I said, why is the Nazionale not more on the case and, you know, getting these things digitized? Because they have all the Galileo correspondence, all his notebooks digitized, which is great, but there's so much that's not. And she said, it's expensive. You know, to get the funding to do that is really hard. So um, I think it varies from place to place. And that's why the Laurentiana is so happy, you know, to pair with uh, something like uh, the Smithsonian, uh, you know, to get funding to do something like this is really important. So you've got a lot of partnerships 
that are uh, work that way these days. Okay, thank you very much. Is there some more in the chat? Um, in, if teaching adults to read in the late 15th century, what books would have been most likely to be used, Boccaccio? So if you're teaching adults, what books do you Teaching use? adults. How to read. Yeah. yeah, I think it would be strange to be teaching adults to read because people mostly learned to read as children in the Quattrocento, except for you know people like Margherita Dattini, who taught herself to read as an adult. Um, they could start with anything. I mean, there was a textbook everybody read. It was the Donatus. Uh, and that was sort of a, you know, a, a grammar book. Uh, people really, for reading uh, Italian, it would be anything you had to hand because you didn't go to a bookshop and buy a book. You, if you had two or three hand copied manuscripts at home, you might have a vernacular Seneca, you know, or the sayings of, you know, Cicero. You might have uh, some, you know, some raunchy poems by Burchiello. You could have anything. And for learning to read, um, just anything that you had around would do. Um, but like I say, it would be odd for uh, teaching adults. I'm not quite sure uh, about that question. Okay. Anything else in there? No, we've got, we've got all the questions from the comments. Anyone else on Zoom want to unmute and contribute uh, live in the library or in the room? No, I think we're coming towards the natural end of a very interesting deep dive into the Laurentian. And we've got two more Biblioteca to come uh, later in this season. So if you enjoyed that, look out for the, uh, the, the next two installments, which are coming up uh, between now and, and the end of June. Um, so it remains really just for me to thank Lisa very much indeed for another most interesting lecture and look forward to more of your adventures in research. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you.